Hello again, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Bishop, the founding editor of Billionaire Tomorrow. And thank you very much for uh, your attention this morning. And uh, now we've got a session here on one of my favorite subjects on this continent, the African continental free trade area. What are the prospects for free trade? The politicians call it the story of the century. Behind the scenes, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Hopefully, these experts with me uh, on the stage will help to unpack that. Starting on my right here with Mr. Ahmed bin Suleyem, the Executive Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Dubai Multi Commodities Center. We also have uh, Mr. Kebor Gena, the Executive Director of the Pan African Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And we also are very pleased to have an expert here on trade negotiations, Dr. Deborah Elms, the founder and executive director at the Asian Trade Center in Singapore. So let's just um, kick it off uh, with each of just a short statement on what are the prospects for freer trade on the African continent. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a message that I've heard a lot of times that Africa uniting will will benefit each other, but the competition is strong. I think the, uh, the benchmarks hasn't been there for a while, but Rwanda has had great success in the past 20 years. Brazil is, uh, has brought back their cacao production. There's a lot of good examples there. Um, better sustainable ways of uh, farming uh, cacao. There's the Cabruca system that was established in Bahia in Brazil. So, you just need to touch base with the, uh, with the uh, top producing countries. China, for example, in the Hanyan Island is producing cacao now, and for the first time in 2020 has exported cacao to, to the EU. So if China can pull up the cacao business just in the last few years and create hybrids and, and new clones, there's no excuse for, for, for Africa. Um, currently, we have DMCC's success and growth has depended on India and Africa, but also um, I hate to say it in this way, but it's because of the inefficiency or the taxes or security issues in Africa and in India that they use Dubai for, as, as a safe haven and a, and a peace of mind and, have, and use it as a, as a redistribution center or sorting or trading. Um, just have a visit to Almas Tower and you'll see, you'll see the interconnectivity. Okay, Kibor, moving on to you. What's your, your take on the prospects for free trade in Africa? Well, thank you, Frank. Um, I just would like also to thank the organizers for having me here. The um, Continental Free Trade Area, of course, it's a project. It's a very large, complicated, ambitious project. It's very different than the uh, European Union project. If you do remember, the European Union project started with four or five countries and then countries were added up based on uh, conditions that they've met and uh, requirement that they were asked actually to fulfill. And so they are today around 27, 28, if I'm not really mistaken. In our case, all the 54 countries were invited actually to be uh, a member of the CFTA the continental free trade area. And then the details had to be worked out actually to satisfy most of the countries. And from where we stand today, actually, the journey that we've gone is quite impressive. Actually, we have about 54 countries that in principle have signed up actually to the CACFTA. Technically, about 37 countries have uh, submitted their instruments um, launching the organization. In fact, last year, from January 21, the CFDA uh, technically is operational. And I say technically because there are quite a few technicalities that need to be uh, resolved. And these are not really easy to resolve. As I said, there are about 54 countries that need to agree on these issues, perhaps not all the 54, but 30, 37. And um, just want actually to sort of summarize it as it is a very large project, an ambitious project. Africans are, want to see the, this agreement to succeed, but there's a lot of work to do. Dr. Elms. 
Thank you very much. So the potential is enormous. You know, if we look at the, the percentage of African trade in the global economy, it's way below what it ought to be. If we look at inter-African trade figures, they are dismal. So there's a lot of potential. But the challenge, of course, is the number. So I, I'd like you all to imagine trying to deal with 50 different people, we'll just stay at 50, to order lunch. Like, how difficult would it be to get 50 people together and decide what are you going to order for lunch? That's the sort of challenges that you have in the free trade agreement in Africa. You need to get more than 50 countries who have diverse interests, diverse objectives, different trajectories, to try to agree on everything from what are we going to eat to lunch to, you know, what are we going to do on various market access for different goods. Eventually, they will have to deal with services, investment climate. They will have to move into digital economy issues. They'll have to think about everything from government procurement and intellectual property rights. I mean, there's a lot of things on the agenda in order for you to realize that kind of potential. And so, I mean, I'm delighted that they've gotten started on this project. It will take time. The sooner that they can move on with much of this negotiation, though, I think the better, especially for the business communities who are looking for uh, some better efforts to realize that potential that everyone recognizes. So I think, again, great, great first steps, really looking for implementation, and then looking for more comprehensive negotiations on key areas that matter for businesses and that matter for the consumers who live in Africa. Well, the prize is immense if Africa does get it together. I mean, uh, if you look at some of the figures, we're talking about a consumer uh, pool of a billion people with a GDP of $3 trillion. Um, and the way in which um, they plan to go about it is to remove tariffs on 90% of African goods to increase trade in the continent, which is still very, very low in world terms. It's about 16, 17%. But that sounds great. What do you think? I love the sound of removing tariffs. I think uh, those who have been following DMCC um, have seen our views on the tax on gold and diamonds. The ministry, the cabinet decided in April, I believe, or May of 2018 to reverse it. And that safeguarded our position as a gold leader and a diamond leader. We're, one, we're less than $1 billion away from taking over Belgium as the number one diamond center in the world. And that's thanks to our trading partners in China, India, and Africa, and the trust we've, gained, we've, we've garnered in the last uh, 20 years. And we, we're, we're looking to capture more businesses. I believe around between 80 and 95% of diamonds from Angola gets redistributed from Dubai. They are building their diamond exchange. We are supporting them there as well in that. Um, on the gold matter, we have three operational gold refineries with two more coming up in DMCC alone. That's not including Sharjah and Abu Dhabi and the rest of Dubai. Um, I highly recommend anyone who hasn't read Madeleine Albright's book, The Mighty and Almighty, you realize the real challenges in Africa is not really the, the African countries itself, but interference from foreign countries. I'm not going to dwell too much into it. The reason she wrote that book is because she left her post afterwards and she can talk politics. I'm not talking politics. But in any case, um, it brings a smile to my face because trade will go to where the least resistance is. And there are good be benchmarks. Um, you know, Mexico, for example, has its challenges but is still a leader in, in exports of avocado. It's the largest exporter of coffee to the US, uh, 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 second to none right now. And they're, they're looking to grow even further, despite the obvious challenges that they've been facing recently. OK, and if I just um, throw forward to you, uh, Kibor, I mean, I've got a quote here from Wamke Lemene, the man we saw on screen earlier. I interviewed him just before the uh, African continental free trade area was uh, uh, launched in January. And he said to me, it's going to be very difficult and take quite a long time. So I'm under no illusion how, how difficult it will be to do this. But there are ways in which we can look at it and try to solve the problem. What ways do you think Africa should be looking at to try to make this thing happen? Well, I think he said it right. As I, and as, as I said earlier, this is something that's going to take time. Um, and it is going to be a process. One thing that, um, in my opinion, that needs to be 
somewhat expedited is once decisions have been taken, once a milestone has been reached, I think it has to go down to the ground, to the private sector, who obviously is the last actually uh, um, entity that is responsible to benefit from uh, the CFTA. In a sense, what I'm saying is we um, should not wait until the whole package actually is complete, but as decisions have been taken, the implementation has to follow very quickly. One of the problems that the continent has is a gap of information. Actually, we practically don't have really solid information as to what each country produces, um, exports, imports. I mean, these are information that should be available actually at national level, in fact, let alone really at the continental level. And I think the organization like ours, the Chambers of Commerce, have really a great responsibility and um, a larger sort of role to play in putting together information and circulating this information. And I think these are the basics actually that needs to be followed up. So Dr. Elms, you were involved in similar trade negotiations in Asia. How would you compare what happened there to what's been going on here around trade in Africa? It's a good question. So Asia is obviously much further ahead in integration than Africa is, but it doesn't mean that they didn't start at different, at the sort of similar places because inter-Asian trade had been very low. And so it's been a continuous process of developing improvements in the way in which they work together. So regional agreements, different agreements bilaterally, agreements that group more countries together, culminating now in the launch at the end of this year of a new agreement in Asia that will pull 15 markets. So China, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, with all 10 members of Southeast Asia into one unified agreement. That's a lot of economic action that is all pulled together. That, that was not easy to do. It took time and it took effort. It didn't take quite as long, perhaps, as the African agreement will take to implement, but that's the kind of, of, of approach that you need to have. And you need to be a bit realistic about these things. So I can say to you that I'm going to drop tariffs on 90% of goods. And the joke that I always make in Asia is, great, then I'm going to remove tariffs on all snow equipment. Snow boots, snow skis, snowmobiles, snow jackets. Nobody in Asia skis, or at least nobody in Southeast Asia skis. So that's a meaningless commitment that I just made. It's 100% tariff reduction in snow stuff. But since we don't care about snow stuff, that's not helpful. What I actually need is reductions in tariffs in things we do trade with one another. So that includes everything from rice, uh, dairy, sugar, you know, a lot of the agricultural products. And I would say the same thing to Africa. It's great to start at 90%, but if we're only removing tariffs on snow skis and boots, that's not helpful. What you need is the reduction of tariffs on things that people actually trade and that they actually need. Uh, and unless you are willing and able, and political will is crucial here, unless you are willing and able to tackle some of those entrenched vested interests and change the narrative, it's going to be very hard to move beyond sort of a lovely sounding, very ambitious, very exciting future to the realities of making trade work better for the continent. And so, again, I, I encourage 90% great but let's make sure it's the right 90%, and especially the 90% that people actually care about, and not the, the, the sort of that last 10% is always where it gets difficult. Okay, well, from a strict business point of view, I have a question for you, sir. I mean, you're doing, shall we say, a very good business with a number of African countries. That business, as you're saying, is gonna grow. Why should you worry about um, the, the rest of the countries, the smaller countries? Why, why should you worry about them? I don't know if, if worry is the right word for me personally, but because I, you can't control what happens. But at the end of the day, if, uh, it's my job to ensure that everyone takes informed decisions. And if they want to take it slower or, or still go ahead and hit a wall, that's up to them. I, I can't push it. I can't influence it other, any other way. But 
Um, there are benchmarks, there has been success stories, and what doesn't work, you know, um, I think it's ideologies and understanding of uh, handling businesses. In the end of the day, equality of opportunity is amazing, is great. Equality of outcome is poison. It didn't work for Lenin. So if I could come to you, uh, Kebor, as well. We did say, uh, we've been talking this morning, saying that it's maybe the smaller countries who might struggle to benefit from a freer market. Uh, what are your fears on that score? Well, it's been said, actually, earlier this morning. I don't know um, how many people noticed. We um, are talking about 54 countries today in the continent. And all, it's very difficult to say all the 54 countries will benefit, actually, from the CFTA. There will be winners and also there will be losers. I mean, this is part of the game in this, in this, in this area. The idea is how can we help those who are categorized as losers to be really part of the family. There is this, this um, we shouldn't really talk about only integration, but also solidarity. Uh, actually, the Continental Free Trade Agreement has to go beyond actually the, uh, the trade uh, integration, but also to bring the whole continent together as one and help each other to move on to a stage where we can actually uh, bring in more employment, bring in more um, diversity in our, in our industries, but also bringing the entire continent closer to one another. Today, the continent as a continent has probably about 54 countries, but all the 54 countries do not know each other, actually. So there is really a lot of effort that needs to be done in that area. So, Dr. Elms, a question I, I'm dying to know the answer from you. I mean, one of the, the main points about free trade on the continent is this idea of proof of origin. How is the Africa going to prove that goods are made there legitimately and not just had a Made in Africa badge put on something imported from elsewhere and flooded into the market? How was that question dealt with in Asia? That's a great question. I don't have enough time to go into all the details, but I would say every trade agreement has this problem, which is I am giving you a benefit in my trade agreement that I am not giving to the rest of you. That's the whole point of a trade agreement. It's not really free, it's really preferential trade. I give you a benefit, I don't want all you people out there to benefit from this. So how do I make sure that that happens? I have to create rules so that, let's imagine the four of us here have a trade agreement. The rules are such that things have to be made or services have to be delivered or investments have to be made by companies in our markets and not just from your markets. Now that doesn't mean that you all can't benefit from our trade agreement, but it means we have to be careful about the rules so that only some of the value can come from outside of our agreement and the rest of the value has to be made at home. Now that's important for governments because they need to show that they are providing benefits for their own citizens. Of course, everyone cares about jobs. But it's also important for the agreement as a whole because again, if we were just lowering barriers to everyone, we, would, we could do that unilaterally. You don't need a trade agreement to get rid of stupid policies. You can just make it happen. But if we want to just give benefits to our friends, then we have to be very careful about how we do that. And so one of the challenges in a trade agreement is those rules of origin how do I show that we made it and not you all made it, is complicated. And it requires a fair amount of training for firms so that companies understand those rules and then they follow them. And this can be a real impediment for companies in using these trade agreements, especially for smaller companies who really struggle with some of this, and for complexity. So the advantage, I would say, and I'll, I'll just wrap up here, the advantage of an African agreement that covers so many countries is that the rules can be put in place that cover trade with the entire continent. If you are a company that is much, much easier to use than rules that vary depending on which final market you want to trade with, and the bigger we have these regional agreements, the easier it is for you to use, and crucially, the easier it is for your small companies to use. Because once they understand the rule, they manufacture a product, whether it's bottled water or it's a jacket, to meet those rules, and they can trade across the whole continent of Africa without remanufacturing, without new rules. And that is actually a game-changing event, which is why we really want to ensure that those rules make sense and that they're communicated to firms so that they can take advantage of the new benefits. 
Unfortunately, we're running uh, near to the end of this session. I'm going to have to ask each of you just to wrap up. Um, some people say it's going to take years. Some people say it's going to take decades. The cynics say it may never, ever happen. I don't know. But I want to know from each one of you how you see uh, the future unfolding for freer trade in Africa. Okay. We've, uh, we've seen some successes in Africa. Not everything is, uh, is bad news. The Kimberley process itself, which was established in early 2000, UAE joining as the first Arab country. We've worked with African nations. That's kind of... I credit that uh, for the majority part of why I have my network in, in Africa, but that's been a success to the point that the, the cobalt uh, challenges are looking at a way of establishing a KP for cobalt because that's going to be a problem, that's going to be an issue for, for phones like Apple and others coming up. I know I'm touching sensitive stuff, but there is hope for Africa and uh, there has been successes and, you know, just use the use use the uh, use the winning uh, systems that that's been used so um, dubai is a success dmcc itself that contributes over 10% gdp to the government of dubai is an example itself and we're more than happy to to uh, support and uh, you know initiatives similar to dmcc in angola congo and uh, and bring bring the coffees that come from congo around the kivu lake area and other places Kibur and um, Dr. Elms, I'm sorry, we're running out of time, as you can see. No, I, <laughs> very I, briefly. I, you know, I was saying that I, uh, I first came here about 30 years ago in Dubai, and um, it wasn't really what we see today. <laughs> and, I, and, and I would say, yes, this is a project, but it is really a project that uh, is possible, actually, to achieve. Decades is too long. Uh, because you have to remember the rest of the world is integrating, and in particular, competitors are integrating. And so if you take decades to get the tr free trade agreement together in Africa, you're missing opportunities every minute of the delay. So I would say the faster they can get it integrated, the faster you can roll out real benefits to real companies and real consumers, the better. Uh, because the world is not waiting. And so you don't have the luxury, really, of decades uh, to get everybody's at a perfection in place. Well, there in a nutshell as the prospects for freer trade in Africa. From me, Chris Bishop, founding editor of Billionaire Tomorrow. Thank you very much for listening to us, and thank you very much indeed.